Mrs. Rose. Um, Richard, I want to thank you for hosting the David J. Rose Lecture today, and I want to thank all of you for joining us, uh, particularly uh, Professor Rose's family and friends. Welcome to MIT. Welcome back to MIT. Um, in President Obama's inauguration speech, he promised to return science to its rightful place. And in appointing Dr. John Holdren to serve as his chief science advisor, he moved the nation importantly in that direction. Dr. Holdren serves as assistant to the president for science and technology, director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and co-chair of the president's council of advisors on science and technology, which we know as PCAST. <clears throat> he brings to this work a remarkable record of achievement with an unusual span from the frontiers of scientific research to the upper echelons of national policy leadership. To describe all of his contributions uh, would be a lecture in and of itself, but since we want to hear from him and not only about him, I will attempt to capture his contributions briefly. First, John Holdren, the scholar. Can't leave out this part because he earned his bachelor's and master's degrees from MIT in aeronautics and astronautics. And following that, he went to Stanford for a PhD in aer aerospace engineering and theoretical plasma physics. In 1973, shortly after he joined the faculty at UC Berkeley, he co-founded and co-led a new interdisciplinary graduate program in energy and resources. In 1981, the first year the MacArthur Genius Grants were awarded, he was decorated with one. In 1996, he joined Harvard's Kennedy School of Government as the Teresa and John Heinz Professor of Environmental Policy and Director of the Program on Science, Technology, and Public Policy as well as a professor in Harvard's Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. From 2005 to 2009, he also served as director of the Woods Hole Research Center. He has authored or co-authored more than 200 articles and papers and 20 books and book-length reports. Among his numerous honors, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Holdren has intertwined his distinguished academic career with equally remarkable contributions to public policy in fields of particular interest to this audience and this lecture. From 1994 to 2001, he served as a member of President Clinton's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, and he chaired reports concerned with the interlocked issues of nuclear arms and nuclear power. From 1993 to 2004, he augmented that work by chairing the National Academies Committee on International Security and Arms Control. In 2003, he helped frame MIT's report on the future of nuclear energy. In March 2009, he became Chief Science Advisor to President Obama by unanimous confirmation of the U.S. Senate. Dr. Holdren has turned the Office of Science and Technology Policy into a dynamic idea zone for new science and technology policies. And though it's hard to imagine how Dr. Holdren manages to accomplish so much and to be in so many places, he has honored, honored us several times since he took office in the White House by coming to MIT to share his insights and wisdom with us. His pioneering leadership on energy, technology, and policy and on global climate change place him at the heart of the concerns of, the David, of David Rose himself. Today, Dr. Holdren will speak to us on the energy climate change challenge and the role of nuclear energy in meeting it. Please join me in welcoming an individual whose life's work beautifully reflects MIT's commitment to advancing knowledge in service to the world. Dr. John Holdren. Well, thank you very much, President Hockfield, members of the Rose family, uh, colleagues, and friends. It is certainly uh, a great privilege uh, and an honor to be here to give the David J. Rose lecture. Uh, I had the pleasure of knowing Professor Rose. Uh, first, I knew him uh, by remote control. I read his book, Plasmas and Controlled Fusion, Rose and Clark, uh, not long after it came out, while I was an undergraduate at MIT. And it steered me in the direction of going into plasma physics uh, and controlled fusion. I also had the pleasure of working with David Rose when both of us were members of the steering committee uh, of a gigantic National Academy study uh, called the Committee on Nuclear and Alternative Energy Systems. It was really about the energy future of the United States. 
uh, took place from 1975 to 1979. Uh, he and I worked very closely uh, in that connection. It was enormously labor-intensive uh, study. Uh, we became friends as well as colleagues, and I learned uh, an immense amount from him uh, person to person on top of all I'd learned uh, from his writings. This has already been uh, mentioned here. He was a most extraordinary individual with uh, very uh, far-seeing ideas about science, technology, and the human condition, and about the importance of interdisciplinary approaches to understanding the relationships among science, technology, and the human condition. This passage uh, on the screen is uh, from the first few lines of his book with Melville Clark, uh, Plasmas and Controlled Fusion. Of course, he started out that book with the largest context uh, into which the uh, issues of nuclear energy uh, need to be seen and need to fit. Uh, I'm going to try to cover this uh, topic with uh, suitable breadth, given uh, the function of, of honoring and remembering uh, Professor David Rose. I'll talk first about the character of the energy challenge and what I regard as the two toughest problems within that challenge, namely how to meet transport needs with less oil and how to meet economic aspirations with less carbon dioxide. I'll talk about what needs to be done in those domains, about what the Obama administration is doing, and I'll focus at the end particularly on the role of nuclear fission and nuclear fusion, both topics obviously of great interest uh, to David Rose during his career. Starting with the character of the challenge, I start really with where we've been and then say a few words about where we're going and why it's problematic. Uh, the last 150 years depicted here in terms of the world's energy supply uh, saw a 20-fold increase in the world's use of energy. The green at the bottom are the biomass energy resources, mostly traditional biomass, fuel wood, charcoal, crop waste, and dung, still the primary energy sources for two billion of the world's poorest people. Uh, even that expanded over this 150-year period, but what you see is that most of the growth was driven in the first 100 years by the expansion of oil, shown here in brown, and uh, in the last 50 years, at twice the rate of growth, the expansion of oil and natural gas. Nuclear is a little red wedge in the middle, hydropower an even smaller blue wedge. If you look at where we were just a couple of years ago in 2008, uh, 2009, a bit of an aberration because of the world economic crunch. So I showed 2008 here. In terms of population, purchasing power parity corrected gross domestic product in trillions, energy use in exajoules, fossil dependence in percent of primary energy coming from the fossil sources, and finally emissions of fossil carbon dioxide, that is carbon dioxide derived from fossil fuel combustion measured in millions of tons of contained carbon, you see what to many people is a rather shocking picture. Even in 2008, the world remained more than 80% dependent on fossil fuels. The uh, dependence in China and the United States, the world's two largest uh, energy consuming countries, even higher than the world average uh, of 82%. Russia, 91% uh, dependent on fossil fuel. Only India has a modest uh, roughly two-thirds fossil fuel dependence, in large part because of the continuing very large role of the traditional biomass fuels uh, in that country. If you look at where we're headed under what is often called business as usual, which doesn't mean nothing changes, it just means things continue to change in the same pattern with which they have recently been changing, you see that uh, by 2030, energy use increases uh, about 60% above uh, the 2005 level electricity, about 75%, and fossil fuels continue to dominate. Under business as usual, you see in this picture, fossil fuels will still be uh, over 70% of world energy use in 2030. Ask what's problematic about this future. Most people will say, well, we're going to run out of energy, but that is not the case. The problem is not running out of energy in any absolute sense. Uh, these particular units are terawatt years uh, of energy. The current rate of world energy use is 17 terawatts or 17 terawatt years per year. Uh, and so you can compare that with the uh, estimated amounts of remaining recoverable conventional oil and gas, unconventional oil and gas, larger still, coal, 
larger than that. Uh, methane clathrates, should we ever figure out how to exploit them economically, larger still, oil shale even bigger. The nuclear fuels, 2,000 terawatt years in round numbers from uranium in conventional reactors, probably 1,000 times more in breeder reactors. That is, uh, 100 times more per kilogram of uranium and 10 times more kilograms made available because you can use much more dilute ores. You could even use seawater if you had to to fuel uh, breeder reactors. Fusion, uh, if the technology succeeds, uh, larger still, uh, enough energy to run a world far more energy intensive than today's for much longer than the expected lifetime of the sun. That's effectively an inexhaustible uh, energy source, as uh, Professor Rose uh, was fond of pointing out. Renewable energy sources in available energy per year, 30,000 terawatt years per year, hitting just the land surface of the Earth, 2,000 terawatt years per year in the wind, 120 in photosynthesis. We're not running out of energy on any interesting time scale or on a global basis. And we're also not running out of money. The next thing people ask is, can we afford to keep building energy facilities at a pace that would maintain this business as usual? This shows projected capital investment for energy supply from 2001 to 2030. Uh, figures developed uh, by the International Energy Agency in the uh, OECD. Uh, but these are figures for the world. The total investment over this period estimated to be about $16 trillion. It would be somewhat higher now because the capital costs of many of these facilities have escalated. But the fact is that this would be in the range of 1% of projected gross world product for the period, only about 5% of projected world investment. It could be a problem in developing countries where by their very nature, capital is short. But for the world as a whole, we could easily uh, afford to pay for this. The real problems start, I think, with the economic, political, and security risks of fossil fuel dependence and extend into a variety of very serious and difficult environmental problems. Increasing dependence on imported oil and natural gas means economic vulnerability, as well as international tensions and even the prospect of conflict over access and terms of access. Coal burning for electricity and industry and oil burning in, in, in vehicles are the main sources of urban air pollution and regional air pollution, oxides of sulfur, oxides of nitrogen, hydrocarbons, and soot, with large impacts on public health and acid precipitation worldwide. And the emissions of carbon dioxide from all fossil fuel burning, the coal, the oil, the natural gas, are the largest driver of what I think we should be calling not global warming but global climate disruption already being associated with increasing harm to human well-being and rapidly getting worse. The further difficulty here is that all of the alternatives to conventional fossil fuels have liabilities and limitations of various kinds. I hasten to say before I show you the list, this doesn't mean we shouldn't use any of them. It just means there's no free lunch out there. There's no silver bullet. Traditional biofuels, which I've already mentioned, fuel wood, charcoal, crop waste, and dung, create a huge indoor air pollution hazard being burned in crude stoves in inadequately ventilated indoor environments across the developing countries. Industrial biofuels can take land from forests and food production and increase food prices. Hydropower and wind limited by the availability of, of suitable locations and conflicts over siting. I should say we're all in this country familiar with the phenomenon NIMBY, not in my backyard. We used to think that was confined to nuclear power plants and oil refineries, but now having been in a struggle for over eight years on Cape Cod to site a wind farm, I have been convinced that the appropriate acronym is now not NIMBY but BANANA. BANANA stands for build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. Uh, uh, 